All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Trina Shanks. I'm professor at the School of Social Work and director of community engagement. Um, this series of calls or webinars have been hosted by the Engage team um, to, to discuss equity issues in social work practice. We started out um, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we've also started to respond to the uprising in support of Black Lives and really all the issues that are coming in quick succession in these times. Um, I'd like to introduce the Engage team, all of whom are on the call right now. Aisha Ghazi Edwin, Fatima Salman, Sonia Harb, and our field intern, Jamie Simmons. Um, we only have uh, two more sessions this month before we take a break when the semester ends. And we're actually transitioning sessions in July. Um, they're gonna be focused on our racial, um, our racist criminal justice system and criminal justice reform. And so we wanna see how we can kind of sustain the movement for black policy change. Um, and so we'll end the month with a special debrief session so we're gonna have two sessions this week and next week, and then a Friday debrief session for us to talk as a school about, um, and faculty, students, and staff, and what we might be able to do as a social work profession to start to dismantle some of the racist aspects of the criminal justice system, um, and also to inform maybe assignments and curriculum and field placements and other aspects of our teaching that might be, um, we might be able to do going forward. Um, to ensure that these calls are as accessible as possible. We are um, starting a new feature with live captions um, that are including on all of our calls. So there's a live transcript of the call that's available and you can click on live transcript at the bottom of your screen um, and that hopefully will help you be able to follow what's going on. Um, next slide. Today's discussion um, is going to be about um, several individuals um, locally who've been pushing for policy reform and ways to combat police brutality with our country and to reform the criminal justice system, make sentencing more fair. Um, we're gonna ha we have four speakers today, um, State Senator Erica Geis, Amani Sawari, Sophie Ordua, and Baraka Sanders. And after each of the speakers um, for the next one. So, um, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our um, state senator, Erica Geis. Um, she is going to be talking about some of the legislative issues surrounding racial police brutality, policies involved and those that need to be changed around this issue, and the work that she's doing at the state level for criminal justice support. So I will pass the mic over to you, as it were, Senator Geis. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanks. Um, and I want to thank the University of Michigan School of Social Work and the Engage program, and Ayesha Ghazi for inviting me to today's program. And of course, I've got to say, go blue. So before I get started, I just I want to um, acknowledge and center um, our conversation, or my portion of the conversation, um, around the fact that we are we're on stolen land. Um, with stolen people um, and stolen labor that built um, a lot of the infrastructure in this country um, and our systems. Um, and I want to acknowledge the collective trauma uh, that especially is a felt, felt by our um, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. And that there's a lot of work to be done towards healing from that collective trauma. And I, I, I want to emphasize that the, the protests that we're seeing today, the widespread calls for change, are evidence of that collective trauma. And that between the effects of the pandemic um, and the numerous extrajudicial murders of Black people at the hands of police, it's become clear to more people um, than before, beyond the people in communities directly impacted, um, that racism is a public health crisis and that the systems instituted from a patriarchal, hierarchical, hierarchical framework, reinforced racism and oppression. Um, and it's most evident in dramatic fashion by the very bodies charged with serving and protecting communities. So our, our police um, and the various types of police um, organizations. 
So those of us who are in legislative and policy making spaces, however, we have a responsibility and a duty, a mandate, if you will, to hear and heed the calls of the public that we serve for the types of change that will lead to healing the trauma that I mentioned at the beginning that are caused by these systems that have been in place for a very long time, centuries even. And I like to look at how we make those changes um, in three areas. So criminal justice reform when it comes to sentencing, um, when it comes to the human rights of incarcerated people, um, and also law enforcement reform. And there are, so I'm in the state Senate and I serve the sixth Senate district, but I'm working closely with several of my colleagues in the Senate right now um, on a package of reforms and proposals um, that would address long-term changes, short-term changes, and look at both the broad strokes as well as the detailed, uh, more meticulous strokes, if you will, um, to address all of these issues um, that we see disproportionately affect Black communities, Black and Brown communities. And right now, um, the work that we're doing, we have put into the various proposals um, or the various legislative proposals um, into four different buckets when it comes to specifically addressing law enforcement. So the four buckets are officer training, the use of force and equipment, oversight, and accountability. And um, as we look at where the legislature's ability is to, to affect change, the changes that we're hearing from the community, um, these are areas that, that we can have policy change um, that would eventually make those changes um, so that there is an improved relationship with the community um, and we can uh, root out and dismantle the systems that, continue to, that continually oppress communities of color. Um, so among the, the very, and we've been looking at, I should say, um, we've been taking input from groups like pastoral groups, um, the interfaith community, um, from listening to uh, the, the community groups uh, such as Black Lives Matter that have been centered in, um, in for years discussing these issues. Um, so uh, everything from how, uh, from training uh, such as rooting out implicit bias, um, reconfiguring um, the, the way that officer training is, occurs, looking at how they respond to, um, to calls um, so, that, um, so that there's more of a trauma-informed response um, and so that there is more of um, less of an, an I guess the best way to put it, less of an assumption of, of guilt when they are responding, especially to certain types of calls. Um, I think one of the biggest things that, that we'll be doing is working on the accountability um, so uh, that when um, so that when officers are responding, um, they are not doing things such as turning off their cameras um, so that um, we are requiring better reporting, um, requiring um, duty to intervene, um, just as examples. Um, but the other piece of all of this is that we need a, if the law enforcement system is to be better at serving and protecting its community, we also need to make sure that we have, that it's more representative of the community. Um, so looking at such things as scholarship uh, and programs for the recruitment of officers of color um, and um, making sure that they aren't just recruited, but that they can also move up the ranks. Um, because when your community, when you are policing, when, uh, when the community 
um, has people who look like it in its in the body that is designed to serve and protect it, I think the interactions um, become um, much better potentially and less oppressive. Um, I don't know if now is a good time to do questions. Hi, uh, hi, Senator Geis. Yeah, I, I, I think this would be a great time to kind of jump in and I just wanna ask you some questions and also I wanna tell the audience, please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A portion at the bottom and we will read them out and have Senator Geis answer them. So, you know, we've all seen these images of police officers like plowing through protesters with their cars or using excessive force. And it goes back to this, this thing about qualified immunity that police officers can use excessive force and be protected by the law. And I know that the movement for Black Lives is really trying to fight that, right? And they're trying to demand some policy change around that. Could you talk a little bit about what is qualified immunity and is there any policy fight happening against it in Michigan? Yeah, so qualified immunity, sort of the, the Cliff's Notes version, um, is when the they they can't be um, they, they're they're really immune from being sued. Um, from or having additional disciplinary action occur um, when um, when malfeasance has occurred when they when they have they've um, done something so egregiously wrong um, it means that they that that could allow them to be rehired by a department or go to a different department um, and not have that history follow them in such a way that it prevents them from being rehired. Um, there is legislation that is being worked on um, around that, and um, that's one of the that's one of the areas that that we're looking at. And um, in 2017, there there was a bill. Well, it became law um, that um, that sort of that kind of strengthened their qualified immunity. And that's one of the things that we need to look at um, to be able to prevent the prevent people from prevent the officers um, who are engaging in such behavior continue to engage or continue to um, or be able to leave one department and um, stay and and perpetuate those actions in another department right right so what are some of the other kind of big I, you know, you know, and we all know a lot about kind of the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement and others who are calling to defund the police. What are some of like, what, how could some of the issues be addressed? Like what needs to happen for some of these legislative issues to take place? I know, I know you said a little bit about how the governor can make some changes. The legislature needs to make some changes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, so the, there are some changes that the governor can do through executive order um, or governor recommendations to the, to the departments, um, but that would really only be specifically at the state level for the state department. So that would be Michigan State Police. Um, and so just, just to give the, the different levels of policing, so you've got the state police, you have the county sheriffs, then you have your individual municipal um, police departments. Um, so it's a broad range of policing that occurs in, in our state. Um, and that's not even getting into some of the, the more, the Michigan being a border state, the other federal spaces that we don't have control over. Um, so, you know, when people think of policing, they're also thinking about um, Customs and Border Patrol, who you often see um, around as well. So, um, but we, we don't. As a state, we don't control CPB. Um, the so the the recommendations that the governor can give, she can also um, have she. So those things go towards the state level. Um, so the um, so for example, she can um, suggest policy changes for within MCOLs, which is their licensing space. Um, 
she can also give directives for MSP on the whole, um, working with their director. Um, as for other things, there are things that the legislature can do in terms of changing the laws. So, um, for example, one thing that just recently passed, um, Senator Irwin's bill, Senate Bill 945, um, required de-escalation training for officers. Uh, and that's something that he had been working on for the entire time that he was with the legislature. Um, and so there are folks who've been working on these things for years. Um, and we're finally at a this tipping point right now where it's getting the attention that it deserves. Um, so that's, and that's something that required a legislative change. Um, the um, Senate Bill 990, which has been introduced but hasn't had hearings yet, um, uh, is by Senator Hurtel, and it would prohibit officers from engaging in sexual conduct while on duty. So whether they are um, whether they are in the process of of arresting a sex worker and a John, or whether they uh, pro prohibit them from using it as a tool um, when, um, or against a, a victim, um, or even against someone that they have arrested for another crime. Um, so those are just examples of, of legisl legislative spaces where we can, um, we can address their conduct. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, that was not prohibited prior to this, engaging in sex with someone that you're arresting, a police officer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when they talk about qualified immunity, it literally is police officers being immune from being held accountable or prosecutable for really many actions. Um, so this is, this is very informative. This is very educational. So we have some questions from people in the audience, and I'm going to unmute these people. We're going to start with Hector Ortiz, who has asked a great question. So I'm going to unmute you, Hector, and you can go ahead and ask the senator your question. All right, you're thank unmuted. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator, for taking your time to speak with us. And I wanted to ask, how can we make the inclusion of Hispanics in this conversation a bit more explicit in the discussion at the and the advocacy efforts because when you look at the data and the statistics um, Hispanics are affected very similarly as the African American and black population but somehow we are not as included um, as we might like in these overall discussions thank you Thanks, Hector. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, and the, I think all of the, the communities of color need to be included in this conversation um, and making sure that communities of color as well as um, disabled individuals, um, because the, the um, and I, I realize this is a topic for another one of the one, one of the Engage uh, nope, seminars. No it's very relevant. So, um, but that you know, in terms of the the otherism that occurs from primarily um, white and very male dominated police police um, organizations, um, there there is this disproportionate. Um, attitude, if you will, um, that our communities are, um, end up being more targeted. Um, and I think, especially when you're speaking about the Hispanic, the Latinx community, which I'm also a member of, um, that there is the added, um, there's the, the added immigration conversation, um, or the uh, assumption that um, someone is um, is not is some that someone is 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 an immigrant or someone is um, is not here um, legally, and that adds an additional layer of threat and peril and trauma um, onto the situation. Um, we definitely need better cross cultural um, training for our officers. 
um, so that they are not coming from, again, a, a position of, um, they're, they're coming better from a better position of protecting and serving rather than, um, rather than trying to assume that whatever it is that they are responding to is um, that there, there must, that some criminal action has occurred. Um, and I think that, or a criminal action has, that has occurred that, that, requires, um, that requires force, that requires something um, that is an addi additionally traumatizing. Um, to, to that extent, one of the things we've been talking about in our, um, in our work group is including, this is relevant for the School of Social Work, is, um, is looking at how do we also engage um, the very professionals who know how to help de-escalate a situation. They're very, you know, do we, when it's a domestic violence call, do we also deploy a social worker? Um, or if it is because, um, you know, someone has made a call that they're concerned um, that someone who is um, mentally disabled is wandering in their neighborhood, that they deploy a social worker. Um, so there are many avenues where we can em employ um, other people who know how to converse with, who know how to de-escalate a situation um, alongside the police, and sometimes maybe even in, in, instead of, um, so that we don't end up having these interactions um, that turn violent or fatal. Thank you so much, Erica. So I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, and this is from Dr. Shanks. So go ahead, Trina, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Well, thank you so much, um, Senator Geis. My question is more about the coordination between the federal bills and ask and what's happening at the state level. Is it better for all decisions to be kind of decentralized in each municipality, each, um, each county, each you know, state make their own decisions? Or if some decisions are made at federal, does that make everything kind of be a little more fair across the board? Just your thoughts about that coordination. That's an excellent question. Um, I would love it if the federal bills passed. It would probably make our ability to pass the, the, the state legislation a lot easier because then um, we can match ours to the federal levels. Um, and so hopefully those will um, get through the legislature and I don't know if that'll happen this year, um, but hopefully those, um, you know, having, having uh, the federal changes as a guidepost um, and a lot of what we're doing does mirror um, some of their, some of their um, proposals. Um, it definitely would make things a lot easier. We also look at what our colleagues in other states have been able to get past um, and how can we make such things, um, how can we make such things workable here in Michigan? Um, so for example, New York um, was able to pass the um, prohib prohibition of fraudulent 911 calls. Um, you know, most people think of those as the, the Amy Cooper bill. Um, and the, you know, it's something I've been working on, um, you know, and then the governor recently in her most recent announcement on, um, on proposals that she would like to see happen, um, wants to see that be charged as a hate crime. Um, so that's something that we're, that my team and I are working on. And I'd like to take it a step further because as, as much as I wanna see something charged as a hate crime, which would be a felony, um, I also, I think part of what the, every time you make a new law, you create a new class of criminals. Um, so I wanna make it more constructive so that the first offense, rather than you getting charged with the, the hate crime, and you go either go to jail or have a hefty fine. Um, we are requiring in the bill that we'll be introducing community service um, with organizations that work with communities of color. 
So because a lot of these, these types of attitudes and calls stem from their own issues. Um, and how do you, how do you be, create a corrective measure that isn't just punitive? Um, Re-educating the person um, to a certain degree. And I think that that will hopefully um, help keep people out of jail, um, but also reinforce the, the change in, in mindset and attitude that a lot of folks um, need. They need a reset. Thank you so much, Senator Geis. So we are actually running low on time and um, we're gonna move on to the next speaker, but thank you. I know there's some additional questions here and if we have some time at the end, we can go ahead and ask them. Great, so, thanks so much. Thank you. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Trina, who's gonna introduce our next speakers. Thank you, Senator Geis. Thank you, Aisha. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce um, two speakers who are going to speak um, in, um, in succession, I guess, um, Amani Sawari and Sophie Ordway. Um, and Amani is activist and campaign coordinator for the Right to Vote campaign. And Sophie Ordway is criminal justice reform activist and a current MSW student at our School of Social Work. And they will both be speaking about the work they've been doing on reforming our criminal justice system. And, um, and I guess Amani and Sophie, I'm going to turn it over to both of you. Thank you so much for having us and giving us an opportunity to speak. I am going to start us off and then Sophie is going to follow up and then I'll close everything out. So just to start, I want to begin. I am a prisoner human rights advocate. I'm a community organizer involved in the National Right to Vote campaign. So the bulk of my work is focused on ending felony disenfranchisement nationwide, particularly in states where people can't even vote while on probation and parole. But our overall goal is to make sure that all people can vote regardless of their incarceration status, regardless of what side of the wall they're on, because we need everyone to be a part of this democracy in order to work the most effectively for everyone. Um, Senator Geis mentioned police brutality, and I want to open up by saying that excessive force and police brutality are a daily reality for people in prison. And so a lot of my work focuses on people in prison because I know that when we raise the bar for how we treat people in prison, we raise the bar for how we treat everyone. And so uh, do, this is particularly due to the fact uh, of a lack of accountability, which is similar to our conditions out here, but it's also due to over sentencing and overcrowding and the vast methods of dehumanization that are used in prisons. And so when we think about the police brutality that we suffer out here that gets captured, there are countless instances of police brutality that don't get captured um, on the inside. And right now, especially during this crisis, uh, as our ability to visit our loved ones is completely restricted, um, our ability to even speak to them over the phone and through digital email is also being heavily restricted. So it's becoming even more difficult to access our loved ones and make sure that they're uh, maintained in proper conditions. And so right now I wanna tell you all a little bit about uh, the statewide work that I'm doing. It's the Good Time Campaign to Repeal Truth and Sentencing. And so we are currently collecting signatures in support of a ballot initiative. Michigan Prisoner Rehabilitation Credit Act is the name of that ballot initiative. And you can find that on nprca.info. Um, and we're collecting signatures to get the question of repealing truth and sentencing on the ballot. Michigan is one of very, tr very few states where truth and sentencing is the law of the land. And not only do you have to serve your entire minimum, but you also have to appear before the parole board. And so oftentimes people serve their entire minimum. And instead of just having a flat sentence, the parole board will flip them 
um, and they'll have to serve even more time above their, their sentence before they can be released. And so we don't want this to be the case in the state of Michigan, and we're trying to change that uh, in this 2020 election. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I wanna give space for Sophie. Thanks, Imani. Hey, everybody. Um, like Dr. Shank said, I'm an MSW student here at University of Michigan. I use she, her pronouns. I've been following Imani's work um, since 2018, and I started volunteering with the NPRCA campaign that she just mentioned in January of this year. And what I want to talk about, though, is another campaign that she, myself, and another student, um, Antonia, who's a law student at Detroit Mercy, are also working on, and we're trying to launch that this month. Um, and that's called the Donate Your Vote campaign, um, in which we're hoping to raise an awareness, as Amani was talking about earlier, around the need to re-enfranchise people that are currently incarcerated. Um, most states, as Amani mentioned, don't allow anybody who's currently in prison to vote. And in some states, that disenfranchisement continues even after people leave prison, while they're on parole, or even after they get off parole. In Michigan, you can vote while you're on parole. So once you're released from prison, you are eligible to vote but you cannot vote while you're serving time in prison. Um, I believe that Maine and Vermont are the only states that allow people to currently vote while they're in prison. Um, and Washington DC just recently passed an amendment that they are hoping to make permanent through a bill um, to allow people to vote while in prison as well. So that's exciting. Um, with this campaign, we believe that people in prison should have the right to vote because the outcomes of any election, of any legal decision, impact their lives just as much as they impact any other life of a person living in the United States. Um, yet without that say, without that vote in the election process, people in prison have very little voice or say in what happens in their future. Um, so a great example of this is the MPRCA that Amani mentioned and is going to talk about a little bit more. We're hoping to get that on the ballot in November, and yet the people that will be most directly affected by that um, initiative will not be able to vote on it except through our Donate Your Vote um, partnership, um, but legally they won't be able to vote on it. Another example of how people in prison can be and are exploited and silenced at the same time is through prison gerrymandering. So it's common practice for most states to um, use prison populations to contribute to the census count. Um, so, and as we all know, census dictates um, a lot in terms of community power, social and political power, where funding comes from, resources come from, um, how representation looks. Um, and so while many counties use prison populations, the bodies in those prisons, to boost their census count, the people that they're using don't have any say in how that funding or resources or how their representation works um, or any say in, in whether or not they even want to be counted as a resident there when most of the time they're not from that county. Um, so we believe, like I said, that no matter what crime somebody has committed, taking away their political agency, their right to vote is counterproductive. It's counterproductive to um, rehabilitation, it's counterproductive to reconciliation, and it's counterproductive to social and community responsibility. Um, and it's also inhumane. If you're living in this country, you're affected by the politics of this country, whether you are aware of it or not, so you should have a, have a voice in that process. Um, so what we're doing is we're following the, um, another organization called the Emancipation Initiative. They're based in Massachusetts. They started their Donate Your Vote campaign back in 2018. And we're following the same model that they're using. We have a website up now, donateyourvote.org. So if you go to that, you'll see a sign up form where you can um, put in all your information and then you'll get an email response that gives you next steps on how to connect to your voting partner on the inside. Um, we're asking that people sign up on the outside. So people in the free world sign up um, until September 9th is the deadline. And then for people on the inside, they have until August 21st to sign up. Um, and we're only focusing on the November election this year because it's already a little bit late and it's our first year. Um, but we're hoping that in future years, we'll be able to expand and also include more states. Massachusetts is still using the Emancipation Initiative to do their state as well. So if you know anybody in, in Massachusetts, you can kind of Google their website, Emancipation Initiative, and donate your vote, and you'll find their sign up form as well. Um, the two main goals that we're hoping to accomplish is to restore political efficacy and power to everybody in Michigan. Um, and 
The second one is that just to try to bridge um, the social divide between people on the outside and people on the inside. And I think Amani is going to talk about this a little bit more in the work that she does. Um, but a lot of times when people are sent away to prison, they can be forgotten, um, but they are people too. So we're just trying to restore some of their humanity. And I also want to acknowledge that many people on this call probably really value their vote and don't necessarily want to donate it. Um, but if your values also align with why we're, we're doing this, we would definitely urge you to just at least consider it. Another great candidate for somebody who would donate their vote would be somebody that maybe is disillusioned with our election process, either because they don't think it's equitable, they don't like either of the candidates, um, or they don't feel that their vote actually counts. Um, they would definitely be good people to tell about the Donate Your Vote campaign, so please spread the word. Um, and then lastly, I just want to point out something on our next slide. I think we have a slide with like links on it. Um, there's a link for the Documenting Criminalization and Confinement Project, which is a research project through the UM Humanities Collaboratory. I'm a research assistant with them. Um, and there's a lot of really good research and, and um, uh, topics, conversations happening on that website. So please feel free to check that out. The link that I've um, posted there is specific to the truth and sentencing page that I've been working on. It's got the town hall recording that Amani, myself, and two other MSW students, uh, Aisha Burns and Lizette Rivera, hosted back in April. Um, and so it, it speaks to why NPRCA, which Amani is, is going to talk about, um, should be passed and why we really need to push for that. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me and inviting me, Jamie and Aisha, to this panel. Um, this is, these are great conversations that hopefully we can continue to have and I'll hand it back over to Amani. So just to close us out with some final thoughts on solutions, um, I want to talk about Sawari Media, which is my company that is sponsoring the initiative petition, NPRCA, which you see the link to, um, and it's NPRCA.info. Uh, the mission is to build community between people in prison, their families, and future advocates, and we do this through prison-initiated campaigns. And so the Right to Vote campaign, a facet of which being Donate Your Vote Michigan, is and was initiated by people in prison during the 2018 national prison strike for which I was the national spokesperson. The Good Time campaign, that legislation was written by a prisoner at Saginaw Correctional Facility, revised by community partners, and then pushed during our 2020 canvassing efforts to be on the ballot. And so what we do at Sawari Media is center people in prison and make sure that we equip them with the resources that they need to amplify their voice and use their experience to make the most impactful change on our criminal justice system. Um, uh, the other facet of the mission is bridging the gap between civic isolation and political engagement. So people in prison are civilly dead. They can't vote, they can't participate economically, they're very limited on participating socially. And so our goal is to bridge that gap and cre create and develop and distribute media that keeps people informed and protects people's right to be informed while in prison. And so right now we have two newsletters. There's the National Right to Vote Report, which is a quarterly publication that goes out to people incarcerated in 242 facilities in 30 different states, including the state of Michigan. And then there's also a statewide newsletter called Motivate Michigan that goes out to about 600 prisoners in 27 different facilities across the state of Michigan, keeping them informed on Michigan specific policy. So you can check out Sawari Media and you can check out those campaigns. And great ways to support us are to get engaged and plug into prison resistance work. You can do that by simply signing up to donate your vote and seeing how that feels to be a part of that program or maybe you want to establish your own prison resistance program with your community on your campus that's something that i collaborate with students to do as well and that's some that's how i met sophie collaborating on doing a truth and sentencing town hall in support of the michigan prisoner rehabilitation credit act so thank you all for having us
Thank you so much, um, Amani and Sophie, for that extremely informative session. I know um, I've had a few classes with Sophie, so I was aware of a lot of work that you do. And um, through that relationship, learn more about Amani. And it just sounds like you guys are doing a extremely amazing and important work. And as a person who does have criminal justice background, I salute you for that and very supportive of that. Um, so I'm gonna ask a few questions um, for you two, and then I will open it up to the general audience. So if you all could start um, submitting your questions via chat or Q&A portal, that would be amazing. One of the questions we have it, um, is about, what are the policies about using prison labor in Michigan? And are there advocacy opportunities um, around this area in the state? The use of prison labor is encouraged in the state of Michigan. And so people in prison work in, in the state facilities doing things like yard maintenance, kitchen, laundry, janitorial services. People in prison are the people that are maintaining the facility itself. Um, and then there are third party companies that come in and exploit prisoners labor, companies like Walmart, Victoria's Secret, McDonald's, um, where they demanufacture products or create products or sew uniforms for those companies. And Michigan, and, and there aren't many states, I think the state of Colorado is the only one that um, abolished prison slavery and does not allow that to be used, but every other state allows for private companies to exploit prisoners' labor and for the state to exploit prisoners' labor. And people in prison make, on average, somewhere between 20 cents to $1.50 an hour. Um, there are some people that do uh, volunteer doing seeing eye dogs, and, and there's no volunteer in prison either because the conditions of prison don't allow you to make free choice. But there are people that work in the seeing eye dog program. They might make $40 a month. I have a friend who makes $40 a month doing that, and that's a pretty prestigious, high paying job. And so um, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, when I think about like prison labor, I think of how extremely capitalistic our society is and how that has influenced um, the mass incarceration era and the continued incarceration of numerous amount of individuals and the over sentencing of those individuals. And because of that, I have another question about how you two um, feel that the push for plea bargains plays into this and how the huge amount of discretion that police officers, um, judges, um, and everyone within that system has in this process that really forces, or what m many folks feel really forces um, individuals into signing off on plea bargains instead of going through a trial system and the entire justice system in that kind of way. Sophie, you wanna take it? Um, I think that it's, I mean, plea bargains are definitely used to coerce people to not go to trial, right? So, and and I think the, the crux of that or the foundation of that reasoning is because people don't want to spend the time or money on a trial. Um, and, and yeah, I think it definitely contributes to this capitalistic um, notion that you mentioned, Jamie, about at prisons being filled in order to um, exploit people to use their labor. I don't know if that's necessarily the main reason why plea bargaining happening happens, but I think it definitely contributes to it. Um, and I think, I think the the main problem with plea bargaining is that people are just not educated about it, and and they're coerced into taking a plea without having all of the resources, all of the information in front of them, um, and it and it ends up being detrimental to them. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but if Amani, if you have more to add. Yeah. When it comes to plea bargaining, it's directly related to truth and sentencing. Truth and sentencing is a tool that forces people to accept a plea bargain because they know I'm going to have to do the whole bit no matter what. So if I go to trial and the prosecutor's dangling a plea bargain over my head of 15 years, and then also saying, if you go to trial, you could get life. 
and you're going to have to do life or you're going to, you might get 20 years and you're going to have to do the whole 20 when I'm offering you 10 and you better take it. It's truth and sentencing is a tool of torture. It forces people to accept something knowing out of fear that they might not get what they justly deserve. And over 90% of people in Michigan accept plea bargains. That is not a just system. Our system's not working at all. No one's going to trial. Barely anyone's going to trial. I have a friend, he denied his plea bargain multiple times, three times. They came at him with 10 years, 13 years, and then 15 years. And he would be out now if he'd accepted the first plea. And now he's been there for for much longer than that 10 year amount of time. And so is that a system that works? If I'm not scared enough, then I might not get what I justly deserve or how scared do I have to be in order to get what I justly, it just doesn't make any sense. Fear should not be the main operator of whether or not someone gets what they justly deserve. It should certainly be a fully educated choice and truth and sentencing completely blurs the vision of how our system is supposed to work. Thank you for saying that. Um, and as if we look at the American um, justice and correctional system in comparison to many systems ac across the world, um, we are one of the only countries that do have sentences past 25 years. And those 25 year sentences in most countries are for like terrorists or extreme, extreme cases of violence. Um, and this actually ties into a question that um, Sonia Harb put into the chat and Sonia, you can um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Amani and Sophie. I was wondering if you could share your perspectives on rehabilitation programs and education programs in prisons. Do you wanna go, Amani, or you want me to take that one? I'll say a quick thing. Over like, over the entire plane of prison systems that we have, the only educational system we have across the board is GED. Go on, Sophie. Yeah. The way that they're currently structured, it's, they don't, they don't work. And they don't, I mean, I think that they're, it's a good idea. And with the MPRCA, we're hoping that that will push more programs to be implemented. So because the idea is that if you participate in these programs, then they get some credit off of your sentence or some time off of your sentence. But so for instance, I have a friend who is helping to tutor somebody for his GED right now in prison. And, and this guy that he's helping to tutor is, is he's got a certain classification where he can't go to GED classes. He's not allowed to, but he still has to take the test if he wants to get parole. And so my friend is trying to help him study for it and pass the test, because if he doesn't pass the test, then he's likely going to get flopped for parole. Um, so I think that the Michigan Department of Corrections touts a really good system and a really good, you know, we, we do have vocational village, we have GED programs, we have all of these programs that help people rehabilitate people. But the reality is that most people don't have access to them. And when even they, even if they do have access to them, they're, they're not really good education systems. The, the same friend was a tutor in one of the GED classes and he said that the teachers don't pay attention to what the, the people aren't actually learning. Um, so I think, if, I think that education systems should be, should be used more, but I think we also need to think about how they're really implemented and whether or not they're really effective. Um, before just adding on more to it, if that makes sense. Yes, um, thank you. And I, I would also wanna hear um, a little bit about you two's perspective on the fact that a lot of, if not all of the um, uh, folks who run the prisons in Michigan are all older white men, mostly over the age of 50. And whether or not you think that a transition in leadership would work um, in maybe having a more diverse or um, set of individuals, or is it the way that they're educated and how the the chain of command is kind of like a stepping ladder system within the within that system of like who gets in control of these prisons and who gets to pull in the educational and rehabilitation programs and how they're implemented. Uh, 
I can speak to that. So I don't think with the way that our system is structured currently, that it matters what the color or the age or the gender of the staff people are. Um, it, it makes a slight difference when it comes to representation, but the, the slave master feeling on the yard is still there, no matter what the color of the people are that are in uniform, they're in uniform in the same way that we work out here. When, when you wear blue, you're not black or white, you're blue now. That's the understanding when behind the wall as well, when you're a CO. If someone puts a complaint against you, it doesn't matter if you're a black CO. If, if they put a complaint against you, your brothers are not the inmates, it's the other corrections officers. I think the best way to resist the system and try to transform the programs that are available is for us to literally step into them and fill those gaps. There were more opportunities for volunteers to come in and initiate programs prior to the pandemic. We could come in, we could do services, we could do poetry. I used to do a poetry program with juvenile detainees, um, but now we're very limited. I'm actually working with students at Kalamazoo College to establish a book club at Gus Harrison Correctional Facility, completely independent of, of the prison itself. We're, we're providing the books, we're buying them, we create the discussion questions, we have a discussion. And this is something that we can do ourselves. We can create those types of programs, establish them through the means that we have, and then they can grow beyond that um, depending on how well they work. But I think it's up to us to fill those gaps because the way that the, that the system's currently structured, it, it's, it doesn't matter who's in charge. We need to go around them. Thank you. And I know that um, State Senator, um, I think you wanted to chime in a little bit about this conversation. Hi, thank you. Um, so one of the, the things that um, a group uh, of stakeholders and I have been working on, had been working on for the past few years uh, was an oversight commission, specifically at Women's Huron Valley. Um, and the, so it's Senate Bill 831. Um, and would be a, a group, a 13 member group that works with the correction, corrections ombudsman um, and have people from various, um, from various stakeholder um, and professional um, spaces who work with the prison population as well as their families. Um, so that's something that should it get passed and hopefully it will. Um, that should, I think, would be useful across the MDOC, the Michigan Department of Corrections, as well as the jail systems. Um, because when you've got that additional accountability, um, when the department has that additional accountability um, to um, people who are on the outside and who are advocating for the people who are incarcerated, um, they can't, they, that the outcomes should be better. Um, and it's Senate Bill 831. I just saw someone's question, Amani's question. So Senate Bill 831 and um, its companion is Senate Bill 830 that specifically addresses um, uh, pregnant incarcerated people um, who are at Women's Huron Valley. But there's so much that we need to do in the Department of Corrections um, that, that that's, a, that's probably uh, for another uh, conversation, but their the the practices there, um, and thank you, ladies, for your advocacy um, for our um, prison populations. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and I know Aisha, you had a question that you might wanted to um, add on. Yeah, um, I wanted to know just what can we do? Like I know supporting your campaign is really important, but what are some other things that we can do to affect change? And so I'd like to turn it over to Amini and Sophie to talk about this and kind of your last words on like what we can take away from this. I'll start if you wanna close this off, Sophie. So what you can do to really impact change is 
yes, supporting the campaign. So right now we're in a really critical point with NPRCA. So if you didn't get a chance to look it up, I'll drop the link into the chat box. Please look it up. And if you can sign the petition and mail it back to us or go to one of our pop-up events and sign the petition because we really want to get this on the ballot and we've got about a week <laughs> to, collect, to collect the remaining amount of signatures. So there's that. And then also think about what your skill sets are and how you can use those to contribute to the prison resistance movement. Maybe there are a, a group of people that you would want to collaborate with on publishing artwork from people in prison. It could be as simple as that. Look for ways to amplify the voices of people in prison so that more people come into contact with those stories and we begin to um, break down those barriers of understanding so that reforms can be something that actually happen more rapidly in our country because not a lot of people interact with the system. Um, they might not have a loved one they, that's in prison. They, they may have never interacted with themselves. So it makes it hard to get people across that bridge. So if you feel in your heart that you want to participate in prison resistance, think about what your skill sets are and reach out to us. You can reach out to me. I'll put my email in as well um, because I want to help you plug in because we need you. Thanks, Imani. And just to keep it quick and reiterate that, I think one of the biggest things we can do right now is to center these stories of people in prison um, and center their their experiences, their voices, their wants and needs. Um, so getting to know people in prison, um, you can do that through, like Imani mentioned, her book club that she started or our Donate Your Vote campaign. I know that the American Friends Service Committee in Ypsilanti also has what's called the Good Neighbor Project, where they connect people um, on the outside with people on the inside. Um, and then also a big thing for me is, is holding our elected officials accountable to, to advocating for these types of changes. Um, talk to your local legislators, talk to your local representatives about these issues and make sure that they're working on them. And when it comes time to vote, make sure you're voting for somebody that has um, solid campaigns about these issues. Thank you again for having us. Yes, thank you so both so much for joining us today. This was extremely informative and I definitely will be reaching out to both of you about this amazing work and being a part of this campaign. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Trina to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Sophie and Imani and Jamie. We appreciate all that you have given us to chew on today. Lots of great information. Um, it is now my pleasure to um, introduce Baraka Sanders. Um, he is currently an MSW student here at our School of Social Work. He's also an activist and also a former juvenile lifer. And he's just celebrated his three year anniversary from his release. So congratulations on that. Um, I also had a chance to meet um, or hear from him a week ago. So I know that you guys have a treat coming in store for you as he speaks. Um, he's going to share his experiences and help us understand issues and change that need to happen. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Baraka. And thank you very much. My name is um, Edward Sanders. I like to um, be referred to as Baraka. Um, I'm very um, pleased to take it on, um, be part of this um, panel. Um, I'm very impressed with um, the two young ladies that just spoke, both um, one of my fellow students who I've been in um, classrooms with, and, um, and the other one is a fellow activist who I've been in um, many spaces with and advocating um, for um, criminal justice reform um, throughout the Detroit area. And uh, so Armani, um, um, welcome um, here at the University of Michigan and you're doing a great job. Uh, <clears throat> my concern is um, too, um, and, and, and these um, um, topics that were just raised are um, dear to my heart too. I'm very familiar with uh, taking and um, um, discarding um, or gutting our um, formal good time credit, um, which was an excellent idea and part of Michigan tradition in taking and um, properly uh, um, controlling um, good behavior, promoting good behavior among incarcerated people. And it was a hate field campaign to do away with that practice with the former um, Oakland County prosecutor, uh, um, Albert Patterson, who um, took and um, used uh, um, the death of um, some law enforcement officers to take and campaign for the gutting of the good time 
and <clears throat> in doing so, um, he created this environment that put us even in front of the federal government uh, mandate that states have um, meet a certain quota in terms of how much time inmates serve and they gave states the money. All Michigan had to do is walk up and grab the money. They had already um, <laughs> met the requirement even prior to the criteria being set out. And we didn't find it hard to bag away from that ever since then. But <clears throat> to get to my um, presentation, um, <clears throat> I am a um, former juvenile, juvenile lifer without parole. I served 43 years in the Michigan Department of Correction. I went into prison at the age of 17 in 1975. I didn't come home until July of 2017 on the 6th of July. My parole had actually been delayed because of the holiday. <clears throat> um, I took and acquired um, some um, um, learning while I was there in prison um, by taking and making good use of my um, time that I served. I acquired a paralegal certificate from Jackson Community College. And during my incarceration, I acted as a jailhouse attorney. Many of the issues that are being discussed here, I have filed lawsuits, um, including that in, in, in involving the um, good time um, credits. <clears throat> um, I also um, took and attended um, Spring Arbor um, College, which is now Spring Arbor University where I acquired my bachelor's degree um, majoring in behavioral science. <clears throat> um, I took it uh, up on coming home. Um, I almost not immediately, but almost immediately got into um, the master's program here at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Um, God willing, um, stay on track, um, learn how to um, manage my time between community activism and actual um, classroom work. Um, um, God willing, I'll be uh, graduating um, here in uh, this fall. I have um, up on coming home, the first place I spoke at uh, was um, at Mary Groves uh, University. I spoke there at least on two or more occasions. I've also spoke at um, Wayne State University um, at its um, law school in cooperation with um, um, attorney um, deal. Um, I spoke um, 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 more than a few times at um, a television um, station there in the Detroit area, WHPR. Um, there's a, a young lady there that has a program, I believe it's called Healthy Michigan. Um, some of the issues we addressed there was um, prison um, um, concerns as well as um, the treatment of immigrant children, holding them in contention. Um, I took and spoke um, um, out about that issue um, some um, time ago. Um, I take and periodically get up in the morning and get on Superstation 9, 10 a.m. and um, take and um, accept the opportunity to be able to give my voice in regards of um, prison issues. Um, I have also spoken on um, national public radio, even though um, me and the interviewer took and spoke at large, there is a, um, a, um, a, a, a small quote that's taken from me, but the bigger conversation, which is what was uh, more important, which is dealing with um, um, juvenile life and how much time they should take and serve in the U.S. Supreme Court's decisions in regards of um, juvenile life. I am a um, single um, father and grandfather. Um, um, I'm a member of the Islamic community. Um, I'm part of the um, board of um, directors for the Islamic um, Organization of North America called Ionia. Um, Imam Mustafa El Turk um, was a um, visiting um, imam inside of the prisons throughout Michigan during my incarceration. And we maintained a good relationship both during and after my incarceration. Um, I'm very active with um, grassroots organizations in, um, um, here in Michigan, uh, particularly uh, Michigan Liberation Organization. We recently took and um, held um, questions and answers or for, put down a format for county prosecutors to take and participate. And we um, recently took and nominated um, two um, candidates for a prosecutor's office, one in Wayne County and one in Oakland County. Um, very enthusiastic about um, Victoria um, Burton Harris, who is the um, um, candidate for um, Wayne County prosecutor um, there. Um, I participated in a um, demonstration um, dealing with the wall there. Um, some of you may be familiar with that, the wall that um, divided Detroit and um, uh, um, the residents um, on the other side of uh, um, Seven Mile 
uh, participated in that up on, on my coming home. I'm an often um, a regular participant in um, the State Appellate Defender's Office, which they acronym is SATO. They have a reentry program. They represent the largest number of juvenile lifers in the state of Michigan. You can go on their website at least once um, a month. I think it's the third Sunday in the month. They put um, workshops together. There are many um, students from the University of Michigan that have participated in their interim um, program to assist um, returning citizens. Um, they prepare these guys' files and everything for the attorneys before they come home, and they continue to assist the guys upon coming home. Uh, and I benefited for, from their um, participation as well in coming home from prison. Um, um, here, uh, what's left here is uh, my, um, my passion and my advocacy for um, criminal justice reform, which is what brings us here today. I have a twofold um, discussion. One is dealing with um, um, the front end of the MDOC uh, and the courts, and the other one is like the back end. One, um, I'm concerned with the, a number of people that are in the Department of Correction that are suffering from mental illness and the lack of treatment and care for those individuals. The, the Department of Corrections uh, uh, prison, uh, the composition of the population in the prison has changed dramatically, but the treatment and the programming hasn't changed to take and address the, um, the present prison population. And that's been a reality, not for a short while, but for decades, okay? We have a substantial number of, um, uh, um, of the inmate population that suffer from mental illness, and not just um, um, slight forms of mental illness, but serious forms of mental illness, and only a few out of that large population actually take and receive actual treatment for their mental illness. And like in any case here in society, the, the reasons that they don't receive treatment is the stigma that is around um, mental illness and is even more compound with a person that's incarcerated than a person in free society because you are living in an institution that has criminalized has criminalized your mental illness and then to get into that institution and then say oh i have an, a, 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 a problem and i want to be treated for it would only take and you know it's like a trauma to even realize i mean to to take and admit that why you are actually in that institution for the very reason of your mental illness. 21% um, of Michigan citizens in prison are being treated with a mental illness. However, there are much higher rates of mental illness than they are being treated. Um, if you look on the, the chart that I got here, um, eight out of 10 uh, um, uh, um, prisoners that are incarcerated are suffering from mental illness. Um, the, uh, in terms of the men, 63% um, have a, a, a serious problems, 75% of the women. <clears throat> and then if you go down, you will see um, the numbers in terms of the men and the women, uh, 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 um, they, they change, you know, they're not equal in terms of that number. But the concern here is, is that you have fewer people being treated, whether they are in prison or on parole, than the actual numbers actually reflect. And the problems with this is, is that it contributes not only to the male treatment of these individuals coming through the court system, but also why they're incarcerated, and then it continue even upon their release. It continue upon their release. This is, these issues that we are bringing up, not just mine, the ones that preceded me. Remember, the Department of Correction budget is like 2.2 uh, 2 billion, you know, it's, it's over $2 billion. So this is not a small matter. Many times, and, and even these numbers that we are talking about is only a small part of the equation. How we got to the shift in the population of Michigan prisoners is, is that you know, there was good heart, good hearted people with good intent, like always. <clears throat> uh, and, but there wind up being a disaster. There was the intent to take and depopulate um, insane silence. 
which is you know one of the names for mental institutions that was used. Okay, and it was intended to take and put people back in the community so that they wouldn't be out of sight of the community, that the community would actually be able to take and see with some transparency of the treatment and the need of these people. So these individuals were taken and moved out of these institutions, but they were never put back into the community because the federal dollars never came. The feds took and abandoned the states and the states were left with these people being homeless and on the streets. And the answers to these problems were, were that they can put them back in the institution, but they couldn't put them back in the mental institutions that had been defunded and closed. And so the decisions that have been made is to take and put them in our criminal institutions, to put them just as they did with immigrants that came from Cuba when <laughs> doing the, uh, the vote lift, the Mario vote lift on when Fidel Castro said, okay, we would advise you, we want our citizens, instead of taking our doctors and our, our lawyers and teachers, uh, we give you those that are in our mental institutions, in our prisons. Well, the United States had done that before Fidel Castro had done that to the United States. We had done that to those that was in our mental institutions. We took and decided to take and put them in our state and federal prisons. And that's where they are today. Those in the individuals that you may not want to give good time behavior to, <laughs> they probably deserve it. And there's, there's good civil rights arguments for lawsuits that they have to live in that kind of condition. You know, when I was in prison, nine out of 10 times, nine out of 10 times, if not more, I was in the cell with somebody that was suffering from serious mental illness. And it didn't happen by chance. Many prison guards, particularly the seasoned ones, know that if you have a problem prisoner, you pair them with a non-problem prisoner so that they can take and somewhat, you know, tame them, to, to bring them down, to help them cope better. And so the same people that you're saying that probably shouldn't get good time behavior, they're earning it and taking and doing what the psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and others should be doing. They're doing it every day in a prison cell that they share with people who are mentally ill, okay? And so this, these are very serious concerns, but when there's a problem in that situation and someone gets a misconduct report, they're not rewarded for that. You're not able to take and go to the parole board member and say, oh, the guy that I got into it with, this guy was a schizophrenic, and, and sometimes he or she may become violent. And I had to, because you don't have a right to defend yourself in prison. Okay, I'd have been through that scenario. You're supposed to run and scream and holler and holler, guard, guard. That's what they tell you you're supposed to do. You can't go before the hearing officer in prison and say, you know, I was defending myself. You don't have that right as a prison. Okay, you are not considered to have the right to have the human dignity to even defend yourself against violent attacks. Okay, so that argument don't 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 go inside a prison. And so this is a real problem. <clears throat> my my uh, interest is, is that we should, and I'm not advocating to keep people or to put uh, on people with serious mental problems inside of prison, but that's the reality. They are there. What I'm suggesting is, is that these individuals should first should have never came to prison. And once they get into prison, we should recognize that they are going through a very traumatic experience. Whatever problems they have is being compiled. And so what I'm asking you is that we at least at the end of this, when it comes time for these people to close and close proximity to their parole, if not earlier, they should be able to take an opt out of the, the, the idea of taking and leaving prison on parole. A parole officer may fit an individual that may not have serious mental issues. But to take and expect a person that is mentally ill to be supervised by a parole officer who, you know, is not, you know, this is a person that has, a, a, and many of them will tell you, they have, a, they have a congested file. They don't have time to deal with that person's um, issues. And they will tell the person, you get a place to stay, you get a job, you don't get those things in a certain period of time, you go back to prison. They don't look at the fact that that person is dealing with mental illness. 
So what I'm suggesting is, is that we should have a situation where they can opt out. And I'm glad that we have a, a lawmaker, a legislator, a member here. My idea is that these individuals should be able to take and uh, um, choose the option to take and opt out and be able to receive the treatment from social, from a social agency, from social workers for the equivalents that they would be on parole, if not longer. They should be able to take and petition their sentencing judge and say, hey, because of my unique problems and situation, I would appreciate if you, your honor, would consider allowing me to take instead of being under parole supervision, that I be up under the supervision of a, 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 um, a, 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 a social worker so that my issues and concerns can be dealt with. This person that's in a, a parole agency is better equipped and capable of addressing issues of housing, uh, uh, um, uh, um, the medical care, employment, et cetera. They won't be just trying to stick the person on any type of job. They will be taking and trying to get them a job that suits their unique situation and condition. A regular parole officer wouldn't be concerned with that. You get a job, and, and that's just that's the bottom line of it, period. And a person with, with unique problems, we don't do that in social work. We don't just put people on any kind of job. We get jobs and we see that the employers recognize their unique um, talents and situations, et cetera. My next concern, um, um, uh, um, concern plea bargain. So uh, I need to take Parker, it. real quick, I'm just gonna jump in. Um, you. If you can kind of talk about plea bargaining about two minutes or so, and then we're gonna go into question and answer because well, people to have a chance to interact with you. Thank you, thank you very much. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have to make the plea bargain one a little bit. Um, and I appreciate the, um, the panelists that came before me that kind of got off into plea bargain because this is my second one. My, uh, um, we know that there's a plea bargain problem in, in the United States, not just Michigan. We have a number like 97% in the federal government, somewhere like 93, 94% in the state government. In fact, some part, some counties in the state of Michigan actually equal that of the federal government. 97% of the people that wind up in prison have pled guilty through, the, through this coercion, okay? And the problem with this is it create a conflict of interest. The prosecutors are the ones that are responsible for taking and bringing charges, but they don't have a responsibility to then also come to the table offering a plea. So my contention is because that is a conflict of interest. They inflate the charges intentionally to take and better equip themselves or advance themselves at the plea bargain table. So we wind up with charges inflated like a cake, okay? So to take that conflict of interest out, a third party I'm suggesting should be involved. And in this case, there shouldn't be legislation. There should be a proposal with the Michigan Supreme Court asking the Michigan Supreme Court to consider the idea of allowing a third party to come in Preferably retired judges that are pushed out because they become 70 years old. These people have an institution, the wealth of knowledge of the judicial system. They will make an excellent idea in terms of using them as the third entity. They should put the bargain on the table and they should only put it on the table after the pretrial proceedings when the test of the prosecutor, evidence of the prosecutor case has actually been put on the table then they should put the bargain on the table and the bargain should take and consider a certain criteria. Hopefully some of you guys will ask me about that criteria during the question and answer. But <clears throat> that bargain should be put on the table. The pre-sentence investigator reporters should report to the court about the strengths and the weakness of these offers. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Baraka. Um, I really appreciate you joining our call today and sharing um, your information. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions and then um, take one or two from the audience if there are any. Um, one question is, how has juvenile life, life or sentencing been struck down in Michigan? And kind of talk about like, what, what's the policy around that right now? And thank you. I, I, I'm very humbled and uh, I'm very appreciative for taking how long been asked to participate in this forum. And thank you, um, um, you and Aisha, uh, for taking and uh, offering me this invitation. Uh, juvenile life for uh, issues, um, 
the question of taking it, um, it, it was the same across the nation. The United States um, Supreme Court didn't tell any particular state exactly what to do. It took and told them when they ruled that um, you can no longer mandatorily sentence a child to life without the possibility of parole. And they used the word mandatory. It had to be discretional. So they took and left the states the free wheel to come up with their own method of how to take and make this decision. Michigan legislators were so reluctant to participate, they had made a decision even before the United States Supreme Court. They wanted to take and already say, particularly our predominantly Republican um, legislative body, they wanted to take and get out front before there was any democratic input or control in the legislature and say, hey, this is how we're going to do it. And so even before a Supreme Court's ruling, they had already took and said, okay, in the event that it happened, and we don't believe it's going to happen, but in the event it happens, um, we would take and allow the, um, uh, 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 um, the person to take and petition the court for resentencing and the prosecutor to make a decision of whether or not they want to agree to a, a, a resentence to a number of years or petition the court for life without parole again. And so this is the system that we presently have. I took an ad state representative, um, Isaac Robinson, before he died, and God bless his soul. Um, me and him was actually working on a proposal to take and put in amendment to the statute because the statute left in there any time frame in which this has to happen, okay? And so this is why even three years after the U.S. Supreme Court's decision, more than three years after the Supreme Court's decision saying that this is retroactive, we still have almost 200 of the 372 juvenile lifers still in Michigan prisons. Thank you. Um, I, I know you're you're really passionate, um, of course, for about this and this process and definitely working to get the rest of those individuals free because no one should spend the rest any huge amount of time and definitely not the rest of their lives into prison. Um, another question we have is um, from your your experiences within this system all the way from up from your initial police arrest to your release, what do we as social workers and activists, um, what should we know or need to know um, in order to start doing work to implement more change and fight more change within our positionalities? Um, we, we um, both faculty and students, and I say to faculty, um, you know, we have um, plenty of opportunities to take and give the student body real issues relevant to current situations, you know, and not be still stuck on some academics that came up 20 years ago or a standard of what's to be taught in the school of social work. We have real social issues. That's our social work. It should always be current and relevant, always current and relevant. Right now we have a pandemic. We should be very you know, capable of taking and switching to this situation. We have um, an issue of uh, 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 racial injustice that's going on around the country. Our conversations, our lectures, the material and everything should be on point. It should be relevant to what is currently going on. Students should be able to have field work that's relevant to this situation. You know, it shouldn't be stale. It should be current. I feel that this is an opportunity for this particular class, this particular session of, of uh, students at the School of Social Work to be the best class the graduate classes of schools of social work because we had the best issues. We have pressing, we have very pressing issues. You know, we found uh, um, in, in years past some of the people that we admire, like Angela Davis, that was recently at the school before um, we was pushed off campus because of the pandemic, and we had the daughter of um, Brown versus Board of Education. We had people who actually left school. They were in colleges and universities pursuing their degree during the 60s when, when, when situations occurred because the schools wouldn't answer their academic needs. They, they found that they needed to be in the streets. These people left school to, um, 
in, in pursuit of their degree, they left that and they went on the streets and sacrificed it and actually continued to, to be involved. And some of them didn't go back to school for 10, 20, or 30 years. You know, we have to respect that. We shouldn't let that repeat itself again. My feet, the whole time I've been here at the University of Mi Michigan, I didn't hear one feet in the door of the University of Michigan and the other feet in the community in Detroit, you know, because there are too many pressing issues to pretend like this don't exist. It exists. Yes, thank you. And you're you're making a lot of good points that actually we're going to have a debriefing session for this conversation that we're having today on July 17th um, at 12.30 p.m. Um, that we're going to email or should have been emailed out to folks, but we'll definitely send a reminder about that exact point of this is a great opportunity for students curriculum field to be talking about these real issues that's happening in the world and really adjusting to them and getting the, the student body that's graduating in December and next spring ready for that. Um, and thank you again for your, your session. You're always amazing and so in inspirational, everything you've done, overcame and done in your life. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Trina. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Baraka. Thank you, Senator Geis. Thank you, Amani, and thank you, Sophie. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for giving their time and their passion and all the work they're doing as well as sharing it with us today. So I thank all four of you for your time. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so um, we have um, been facilitating these volunteer opportunities. So for anyone who's on the call wanting to get field hours, we wanted to remind you to look at the list of volunteer opportunities, to fill out this form if you volunteered, to talk to your School of Social Work field instructor to make sure you get appropriate credit. We also have an archive of all of our past sessions, just um, so you, if you're interested to look at any of these. Um, and, and given that I mentioned we're changing the format of our call, we're having one more call um, session next week on the intersection of race, disability, and police brutality, which was mentioned a little bit by Senator Geis, but it's going to be the topic of the next conversation. And then, as Jamie mentioned, the next day on that Friday, July 17th, we're going to have a debrief about what we can do as a school around community justice reform issues. So we hope that each of you got a lot out of today's session, that you will continue to join us next Thursday and the following Friday. Um, and um, again, feel free to um, email me or anybody on the School of Social Work Engage team if you have questions. Thank you so much for your time. And I guess we'll close this session out today. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.